Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is S.C. Coleman, author. And uh, I'll start out by saying, yes, I know this is technically a wine glass for white wine. But I'm going to be using it for red wine. Now, in this video, I'll be covering a variety of different topics and subjects, which tend to, as normal is normally the case, tend to link together, but are but can also be divided. So we're going to start out first with a sort of background, uh, a sort of, uh, shall we say, synopsis of history, uh, politics, and uh, government structures. Now there are essentially two types of family as far as we understand that word to mean. Family, of course, is the basic unit of concept which forms the basis for what we call government politic political structures organizations corporations whatever you have it family the word family forms the basis for that and there are essentially only two types or at least two ways of measuring family the first is by bloodline your blood percentage uh, you know the that type of thing a bloodline family would relate naturally to birth now you can have estrangement which causes family dislocation meaning normally normally the idea of an estranged family member is somebody who is a stranger to the family so this concept of bloodline specifically rates relates only to family by birth uh, what some people might refer to as blood percentage. It, you can practically speaking have somebody who's not considered a member of the family, but is related by blood. That would be the idea of estrangement, which usually has to do with dislocation or being separated apart, being in a different location. The next type would be that of adoption. Now, adoption today, we only understand just like family and just like bloodline and birthright by bloodline we understand in a very narrow sense that's on purpose that is part of the mental programming uh, initial thought association that you learn in the school system however there's many ways that adoption uh, relates to family and there's many types of families that are formed out of adoption which are only in referenced as family in some sort of metaphorical sense. But in reality, the majority of families today are based out of adoption. So essentially the idea with this is alliances are formed out of adoption, but you can essentially have estrangement that happens even with adoption. Now there's people who are adopted into families based off paperwork, and then there's people that choose without any paperwork to adopt a family or adopt themselves into a family. Marriage is in fact a form of adoption into another's birth family. Even if, as everybody knows, as the saying goes, when you marry, you marry your spouse's family as well. Well, that also has to do with the fact that if you marry into a family, you also marry the estranged distant relations of bloodline that's how the concept generally works in current practice but there's other ways that we're not supposed to think about adopted family most of the time which is with friends friends technically speaking are adopted into the family through ritual custom over time right you establish friendships over time like your best friend from high school all that stuff they're actually adopted in the family. They just don't have any paperwork. So most of the time we only use adoption in this one sense, when in fact there's many senses of it. And you have to understand those many senses of adoption and family structure to comprehend the past and how the past structures actually worked, how government was actually formed, not this current phony control structure we have today. Now the control structure we have today is primarily only focused on bloodline family. 
And the reason you see this is because in all of their overlays, all of their attempts to control information, language, history, custom, practice, everything, it always comes from the singular perspective of a blood right of family through blood line. So when you understand it in this context, there's the 13 bloodline families is often referred to as the quote unquote conspiracy about it. Now, I don't know whether it's a myth or reality. I don't know if there are 13 or if there are more or less. But the one thing that's very apparent is that the perspective of blood right is present in everything in the perspective and representation of kings, of politicians. You have to be brought up in the right family to become a politician. You can't come from you know, a bad background or it will haunt you forever or they'll try to make it haunt you forever. Everything comes from the perspective of blood right, right? That's the biggest thing there, blood right. You see this thing constantly re rep uh, replicated everywhere about pure blood, pure blood heritage. And the pedigree required to be a royal, right? You have the, the system that they have in England and other European places and Saudi Arabia where you have to prove your blood pedigree, your quote-unquote heritage, in order to be a part of a family, a royal family or whatever. It's not hereditary right based off of adoption because you could be legitimized and adopted, but in this context, you'll never be recognized because you don't have the blood right. You're not legitimate by blood. So a lot of this stuff you see being repeated, this, this concept. And in this sense, oaths mean nothing. If you recognize only the blood right perspective, oaths mean nothing. Allegiances mean nothing. Everything is done in context and terms of a ruling family based off of blood, the blood right. So you can understand from this perspective that essentially any other family, any other family structure, any other organization is considered an opponent, an enemy. Somebody with that perspective has no trouble trafficking other children, doing nasty things to other families and other people because they are not part of the bloodline. They're not part of the blood family. If you are part of the blood family, then you have a duty and responsibility to the bloodline and nothing else. So naturally, family is a French word, which we've been mistrained intentionally about the significance of that word, the many different definitions of it. But it is obvious that it has many different definitions when you realize the similar word of familiar relates to being uh, uh, comprehending and understanding something over time. Being familiar with it means that you uh, you grasp it in, in concept, in practice, in everything. If you're familiar with the mechanics of a vehicle, it means you comprehend the structure, how it works, and change things out with it. It doesn't just mean that you're partially familiar with it. You can be fully or partially. So familiarity does have levels to it. Familial is in similar relation to familiar, something relating to family. You can have familial relations, but you can also have familial land, familial objects. It's something that relates to family and is similar in concept and in use with the idea of fame, being famous, being known, being familiar. So this is where we get into the split of the concept of legitimacy of heirship. See, we're taught always that there's the divine right of kings and royalty, and these things are repeated all the time. Well, they're false in one perspective. In the past, a large number of legitimacy of heirship did not come from blood right, but that's what we're taught because that's the singular perspective which we've been fed 
contrary to the legitimacy of heirship by oath. So when you talk about an heirship, usually it's something that your family is bequeathing to you. And if you don't have, well, usually that, that's the other thing is that then you get into the concept of who's the most legitimate of heir. Is it the person who's, can, who's got a blood right, a blood tie, or is it somebody who's familiar with the person? And then you get into the idea of documentation, a testament, or the will. Somebody who bequeaths something in writing, who, who puts down the fact that they want this person to be the heir, and they chose that person. It is not off of blood right or any other claim alone. It is the will of the testator giving their will to that person. And then you can have legitimacy challenged based off different aspects. However, if you have a will claiming this person wants their heirship to go to this individual, there's not much you can argue with the will of the person. On the other hand, if it's not up to them, then you have an issue. If it's not theirs to bequeath, then they can't legitimize, legitimize the next heir because there's a, pa a way to get that. Like the uh, elector of the Holy Roman Empire could not simply bequeath that to somebody else. See, we're taught always that there's a bloodline, that the elector is chosen by birth, but that's not true at all. The elector is chosen just like the kings were chosen among the nobles. There was a way to do it. It did not have to do with birthright. That's a, a perspective that when you put it in association to certain things, it doesn't mingle right because it's not realistic. And if you ever look into certain things where that's been placed, there's anomalies, there's things that contradict each other that pop up because they're lying. There's only that perspective in the current narrative today. And naturally, the most, the, the most important thing that comes down to the, to the most heir apparent, the most apparent heir, the person with the most apparency appearance of that heirship usually comes down to land rights. Who controls spots of land? So when you talk about who controls land and the conflict over that, you'll have to, of course, start at the beginning, which is the idea of a clan. See, we're usually taught that a clan's a family by birth, but you can always be adopted into clans, and I would say, by and large, the majority of people throughout history and throughout the globe were adopted into clans rather than born into them. But that's hard to say. It's not going to be the same case in all aspects, and many clans might have different rules about how you can join their clans. But either way, Many in the past who have been adopted into clans now have this blood right nonsense imposed upon them, like with the so-called tribal nations of the American Indians or Native Americans, whatever you want to call them, that blood right is imposed upon them. And the majority, of course, were adopted, so there's no blood connection other than marriage and things like that, having children with that sort of thing. Of course, naturally, most of it comes down to simply arbitrary skin color and not actual blood percentage. But either way, they put the blood percentage on clans of adoptees so they can splinter them. That's the idea. But the original form were these clans, these families, and then they would get together with and they would have a representative of the clan who would then go to a union of clans. And this is essentially the idea of the formation of the state of Prussia, the union of clans in Ireland. Scotland was a little different, but Ireland was elected a king out of the clans, the king of the kings, basically, king of kings, right? You had a similar structure, allegedly, with the Hebraic empires of the past. You have a similar structure in many places, whether you call it a clan or whatever you want to call it, these families, not necessarily by blood, would elect, would choose among them a representative who would then go and represent them at a group of the clan heads 
the family heads, whatever. And then you would, that's where you get your idea of joint chiefs. The ones who choose from among them the overall leader of the clan union. And in other places you might call this a headman, the head man, the head of the household, right? We have all these different ways of explaining this structure. Well, this is, of course, the original structure, and this is where most of this comes and was usurped by the, uh, the inaccurate perspective of a blood right rulership of blood families who rule based off of that alone across the planet. And they do this through subterfuge and the targeting of what they would see rival families. Now, in order to obtain a presence in many of these clans, many of these organizations, they had rites of passage. Things you had to do for joining, for being a member of it, requirements. But they also have rites of passage for airship. Now, the Marine Corps, the U.S. Marine Corps, is a primary example of this. The Marine Corps in the United States not exactly the globe, but in the United States anyway, is an accurate representation of the old family style structure. The Marine Corps is a family, not by birth, but by rite of passage. Because you go through the crucible, you go through basic training, you are formed into a Marine, and once you become a Marine, you are a member of a family. It's not just an organization. You have everything that a family would have. You have customs, traditions, you have family culture, you have events that you have to take part in, and in many cases you end up having a stronger bond to your family members of the adopted family of the Marine Corps, which you chose to adopt that family by voluntarily joining the organization, well you have more ties to them than you do to your birth or blood family. So there's a big difference. And I don't actually believe that the whole blood right family concept is inherently human. Many people will come along and say things like, you can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends. And then that narrowly focuses the idea of family to only mean blood right. So there's a, there's a obviously targeting of family in concept, not just by birth. So naturally the enemies of this blood right family would also be opposed to the religious control of this blood right family. The primary enemies and focuses of the hatred of this controlling bloodline family would be those that not only formed a strong resilient family structure in opposition and doesn't recognize the supremacy of blood right, but also refuses to engage in the division that, it, that these blood families bring through religion. So some examples of this would be the, uh, which, well, it comes from the, the idea of a uniform law rather than a religious law, the so-called law of man versus God. So these men get together and they decide uh, a law, whereas the bloodline families get together and they decide God's law. They are God, they impose God's law. That versus the perspective of man is creator, made in the image of the creator, and so anything man creates is created by the creator in service of the creator and man. So, that's the main concept here. Usually when somebody refers to God's law versus man's law, they're talking about those bloodline family control structures where you can violate laws of man because they're subservient to the God's law. However, so naturally with that perspective, there's a hatred of individual organizations that put a blanket law that applies to everyone regardless of your birth. That's the big one. Regardless of your birth, you have to adhere to this law. Anyone who's part of that bloodline, 
who owes allegiance to the bloodline and nothing else would naturally consider that the ultimate enemy of their institution. Some of these enemies, the first would be Prussia. Prussia is the primary target of the Nazi control structure. Not the originator of it, but rather the sins of this bloodline family are imposed upon Prussia for one very specific reason. Prussia did not engage in the war of religion, the Protestant versus Catholic catechism fissure that was imposed upon Europe. Prussia was neutral in that contest. They refused to engage, and that was because they had a law superior to that of the church or any of the religious structure. They did not care what you believed, where you came from, what your birth was. They only cared about you following the law, their law. So they were neutral in that, which meant that they were resilient to being divided. Their, theirs was an identity state of Prussia, which did not engage in the religious division, and thus they became enemy number one for this bloodline control structure, which is very meticulous, methodical, and patient in dismantling its em enemies through image and everything else. They lumped this idea of ethnic Jews, ethnic birthright religious control onto the Prussian state, saying that they were hunting down ethnic Jews when, uh, under the Nazi umbrella, when in fact Prussia has always or was always ever neutral in any question of religion. Now you could say, of course, oh, well, you know, that's, that's one example. It's a very good example, but it's only one. The next example is, are the constitutional states of America. The true republic of the United States before the corporation under uh, guidance from these bloodline families took it over. The constitutional states of America, as written in the U.S. Constitution, specified that no religious test shall be required for the holding of office. It, of course, goes on further saying that putting in these due process things, everything and, and that Congress shall make no law regarding the practice of religion, right? No law regarding the practice of religion. The Constitution had nothing to do with religious control. You could not be divided based off the subject of religion under the Constitution. It was, you violate the Constitution. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you believe. You violated our law. Big difference. Naturally, that would be an enemy of control structures like the Universal Church that declare ownership over the planet. Jesuits, Catholics, all of the different, all, the Pope, right? All of these different control structure organizations that all base your religious faith off ethnicity or birthright, blood right. Not your, you cannot choose to practice anything else because your religion is based off of how you're born. It's just like when I go out and fill out paperwork and I say things like I'm Buddhist or I'm a spiritualist or any of these other things. Well, my responses are always changed to Christian, whether I want it to be or not. So that is the perspective. Now, another structure, and this is the reason why they despise American Indians so much, they want to destroy so much the American Indians, just like with Prussia and just like with the Constitution. They spend so much effort on not just destroying the structure itself, but destroying the whole concept and the whole memory of it completely, wiping it absolutely from the face of human culture, is the Degean Sioux structure, the, what they call, anyways, the Degean Sioux language family. It doesn't just have to do with the Sioux. It has to do the, with the Illinois, the Iowa, the Kiowa, the Arkansas, all of these different groups of Cherokee. Every group is in some way related to the Degean Sioux. And most of the people in the United States of America that are born here have some blood, blood right relation to members of the Degean Sioux republics, which formed most of their work through adoption. 
which means they adopted all sorts of Europeans, Africans, it doesn't matter. They adopted so many different people into their nations that the entire bloodline was scattered and was a really big problem that the these bloodline control people hate. So they really, really despise anyone who is related to the Degian Sioux Republics or the so-called First Nations. The next one are the North African Republics called Barbarians or the Barbary Coast. And the other thing I wanted to say about the Indians is that they did not care what religion you practiced. The Indians were always spiritualist. This idea of this New Age Native American religion crap is lumped onto it. It's put onto it because these bloodline control people refuse to accept the fact that somebody can choose their faith. You can only be born into your faith. Now, the North African republics were a little bit different because they were essentially Muslim. You, in order to have office in these republics, had to convert to Islam, all those other things. Now, the difference is that they worked, in many cases, were successful because they enriched Christian pirates against the kingdoms of Europe. So they worked with other uh, religious structures. They did not they they did not accept the idea that you were born into your religion and they did not accept religious control as uh, paramount. So that's why they gained the wrath of these bloodline control individuals. So the, it always comes down to the no preference towards religion whatsoever. It's you follow their law regardless of what religion you choose, regardless of how you're born. That's a big problem. Now, the, the last example will be the Japanese, who did not persecute Christians for being Christian. Instead, they executed those that violated their laws regardless of religion or faith. And so naturally... The bloodline control structure, which only recognizes religion by birth or ethnic religious, they had a problem with that because they, whenever, wherever they go, want special preference based off of their birthright, their bloodline, and their born into religious structure. So, the, be, obviously, because of the challenge to the religious bloodline supremacy, every single one of these entities had to be completely and utterly eradicated, even from memory, and denigrated to such an extent that, as it says in the canon code of the Vatican, will never be resurrected. Although, when, you, when somebody comes along and discovers these things, despite their best efforts, it makes not only them look stupid and ineffective and inefficient, but it also ensures that not only will these things come back, all of them will come back in a much stronger and more terrifying manner than these people could have ever imagined. Instead of having just the Constitutional States of America or just the Prussian Reich or Kingdom or just the Japanese Imperial Kingdom or just the Republics of the Degian Sioux or North Africa, You'll have them all together, united across the planet in so many different forms that it's absolutely impossible for these bloodline supremacists to ever, ever come back again. Now, there's the Dewey Reams 1899 American Bible. It Essentially, there is this passage in Matthew 4, 8 through 9, which describes the subversive uh, confidence game that these bloodline families practice and the primary the primary uh, really well known tactic they use are false promises also called bait and switch or the deal with the devil and of course this is where the deal with the devil comes from the concept of course of a deal with the devil is that you make a deal with them but they construe it in a way that you didn't intend, obviously. So it states again, the devil took him up into a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said to him, all these will get, I will give thee if falling down thou wilt adore me. Of course, those kingdoms weren't to be given and it was a false promise. That's very clear. So the promised land con 
is the primary and possibly one of the oldest false promise cons that's still alive today. It's very obvious in the so-called land back scheme in which they're going to quote unquote give the land back to the American Indian Republics. Not only is that a false promise, but the American Indian Republics did not recognize land ownership. They recognized freedom more than ownership. Freedom was more important than ownership or possession. Now, obviously, you need freedom to, to possess certain things and so people don't obviously come along and steal your work and things like that. But freedom of movement is far more important than the possession of land. So this whole idea of giving them the land back is a joke. And it's primarily used to get ignorant people on behalf of the, under the American Indian name to go around stealing land from other people. Now, the Book of the Mormon also practices this promised land con, but it is obviously most evident when it comes to ethnic Jews. Not obviously those that adopt the faith, but those that are quote-unquote born into it are the promised people. And they replicate this same land, promised land con on so-called black Jews to try to get black people to convert and they use this exact same con with ignorant Muslims or people who are fighting on behalf of the so-called Muslim faith. In every concept it's promising land for service so that that person needs to go kill and take it by force because it's theirs and theirs alone. And it's a con. It's a well-known con and it also takes many forms today but it is most evident in the biblical uh, misrepresentation of the promised land to the Jews, the people of the Jews by birthright. And this comes from a obvious misinterpretation of this idea that the people were given the world. You will have groups that come along and then they will claim as part of this con, that it was talking about them. They are the people that it was talking about. Not everyone else, but only them. And they own it, it's theirs, they claim it. You find this same tactic used when it comes to we the people. You have groups of people continuously going out referencing them as we the people, and their tyranny, and their usurpation of the Constitution in context of them being we the people that the Constitution talks about. Obviously misconstruing what it's actually talking about because they're pulling out of context and all this other stuff. But either way, this con of false promise can be found with all these, with the Vatican constantly promising a land empire, land it doesn't own, it pledges to different kingdoms and groups. But the secondary thing that gets most people, actually I would say probably more than the land con, the land prom promise land con, is the idea of a hidden fortune. Somewhere out there, there's all these fortunes just waiting for you to find. But of course, in order to do that, you have to jump through a bunch of hoops and obviously serve the one promising it. There's of course royalty by appointment, being appointed to a position of royalty, rather than by birth or oath or occupying that position because you're good at it, but no, by appointment. And this, of course, is also used for promotion, the con of promoting somebody to a position they can't practically handle, but that doesn't matter because they use promotion as a confidence gambit. And then, of course, you have the idea of birth heirs. And the thing that you notice with many of these things that to find these fortunes and things like that, there's often no direct correlation to the validity of oaths. They don't recognize oaths as being of any value or of any importance. The Sestiq V Trust and the Nigerian Prince scam are two scams that not only relate to hidden fortunes, but also to hidden royalty by birthright. With the Sesti QV Trust, him that lives, or he he who lives, that is, is how you have many different con men going around today in the United States specifically, are promising that there's a 
a trust out there with a whole bunch of money in it. They just had to figure out how to claim it. And obviously along with it comes title to land and assets and property and things like that. Now the Nigerian print scam is all about the fact that there's a distant uh, royal who has been had his throne based off of blood right, mind you, by birth, has had his throne usurped. And if you helped him claim it back, obviously by providing him the funds to do it, then he will cut you in and make you a member of his royal family. The idea of a return on your investment is another con strategy of a false promise. So generally there's ulterior motives more than the simple uh, theft. In the deal with the devil, we're only usually taught about maybe one ulterior motive, right? So you ask for a pile of gold and you get a pile of fool's gold or you get a pile of gold that's tiny right so those are all the the ideas is that there's only one way to misconstrue it however with these things there's usually more than one ulterior motive not just the singular one of the trick but also in some way that it benefits in multiple ways the ones imposing the con doing it uh in most cases, people trade their life via their time for the false currency, the so-called money that we call today. That, of course, is a big con. Now, the land, the interesting thing about the promised land con is that what most probably don't understand when they go out trying to conquer the land is that, yeah, they'll be allowed to have the land under certain conditions, and those certain conditions are going to render the land polluted and desolate. So, yeah, have fun. You now own a desert. That's essentially the idea behind it. The next one is the creative, or is creative work, somebody who invests time and effort and things like that. They will give that up out of the promise of fame. Of course, it's never really specified what exactly that fame is, but the fame's promised as long as they give up their work and stuff. And then, of course, the way that happens is that the work becomes famous, but they don't reap any rewards from it. Somebody else who they uh, promised their stuff to to become famous, they reap the rewards for it, and the work alone becomes famous in someone else's name. And then, naturally, the biggest one of all is the promise of rulership which leads to the enslavement of the one who is seeking an appointment to rulership from the one using it as a false promise. So with the SysDQV Trust scam, which is related in, in essence to what many might call the uh, American National Movement today, well, the primary trick, the primary purpose to that con is to gain documentation for complete identity theft. It's a little bit similar to the scam that was really easily recognized by people online in which somebody would post something about uh, about try to figure out their birth date and favorite color. You know, like those things that we've seen about your name is the, is the last thing you ate, that type of stuff. All of those things are designed to get people to provide information that can then be leveraged to say take out lines of credit, credit cards, things like that. But this SysDQV scam goes even further because the mark will willingly and w work with the person scamming them and will publish their birth certificate, fingerprints, and also the forms renouncing citizenship. Everything not only required to steal their identity, but to use their identity to set up corporations, all kinds of things in different countries to... to um, enroll them in citizenship in whatever country that the person wants and also even adopt that person's identity because now they have a birth certificate and fingerprint. They can match everything up to themselves. They can copy the fingerprint. They can copy the paperwork onto anything and go anywhere using this person's identity. Completely adopt it. So that's a, you know, you, uh, the, the things that you can do with someone's identity and have them, of course, holding the bag for it are endless when you have all of the documentation because that's essentially the only documentation that most people, most organizations require today for verification of identity. In other systems that might not be the case, it might be a little bit more difficult to steal someone's identity. 
But either way, this is all done from not only the false promise of hidden fortune, but also from salvation, from the consequences, from the control structure that was set up by the very people who are going around and scamming them in the first place. This is obvious when you look at the leaders of the so-called American National Movement trying to get people to go and invest time, effort, and resources into propping up the fake judicial court system, which runs these false authentication methods to begin with. And also under the guise of them gaining something called diplomatic immunity, which is an invention by the very same control structure that many of these people are attempting to get uh, salvation from, because they've been arrested, they've been put up, put up on phony charges, they've had their lives navigated so that they become a convict, somebody useful, and then these people are then taken hook, line, and sinker by the very individuals that do this stuff to them in the first place. So those people can then hide under the identity of those they've abused and get away with their crimes, and they hide under literally under the identity of their victims. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to root them out. Obviously, you don't want to go after the person whose identity has been stolen because that's a waste of time. There's many patsies that have been set up that have had their lives orchestrated in most cases because of the control structure of these secret societies doing it on behalf of the blood right group. Well, they are the true culprits and obviously they do this stuff to hide from the consequences of what they're doing so it's no easy task to uh, get rid of them now they also on a double uh, another reason for these operations these conf confidence strategies and organizations and tactics is not only to gain all of this stuff false identity to, to gain control over somebody's life, you know, everything else. But it's also so that they can denigrate and mock true concepts by lumping them in with the marks that then they go after the marks and set the mark up as the distraction, right? Now, the primary one is are militia groups. Militia groups are usually staffed by convicts, people who have gone through that system and they've been molded to become malleable marks. Usually, militia groups are not staffed by true warfare operators or veterans of combat or any sort of honorable structure of military valor. They're usually individuals who are made to be contemptible as marks and set up as a joke to undermine the constitutional concept of a militia, specifically to target the constitutional concept of a militia. Of course, they replicate this also with the American national and sovereign citizen uh, labels so that they can take somebody who has legitimate legal argument and conceptualism so that they can blanket ignore things like acting on your own volition or what they say pro se. Pro se does not have to mean going to their phony banking courts, but rather representing yourself in a community. But when they put it into this context, they can mock it, denigrate it, and try to get other people to, quote unquote, go out and not represent themselves pro se because they're automatically going to lose the case. Well, in most cases, anybody who go into that phony court system loses the case anyway. House always wins in that context. But if you go and represent yourself in a true court, in a true fashion, outside of their control, well, then they've got a problem and you become a real enemy which of course is what you want to be because they already they either look at you as a problem or they look at you as a mark something to be harvested somebody to have all their stuff stolen who's easy and gullible to manipulate whereas if they recognize you as a true enemy then at least they might be a little bit more cautious about how they deal with you and if they don't hopefully you're capable enough to cause them damage and to punish them for underestimation. The clean-shaven samurai concept is another way that they denigrate uh, their enemy because a clean-shaven samurai is, as far as the old culture goes, tantamount to being a woman. See, in the uh, book Hagakure, it states that samurai, or warriors in feudal Japan, so-called imperial Japan, whatever, the various periods of time before the 
bloodline control imposed their will on Japan. Well, you know, they, they've they had some eff- ability to do that over time, and, and there's always been contests in Japan over their control. So they might present themselves as having over control over it because they refuse to recognize any other uh, groups or concepts out there. But usually reality is not the case to what the narrative is that they uh, impose. So the samurai would grow uh, facial hair, mustaches, and things like that. And so when they go around saying things like Asians are incapable of growing beards or or uh, mustaches, well, that relates to the fact that when a samurai would kill an enemy, they would take the facial hair, specifically the mustache, the beard, whatever, to show that they had killed a man, an actual warrior, and they had not just killed a woman, uh, somebody who was not competent as a valor in valor in combat they're saying they they killed somebody who was difficult to kill to represent the fact that they had done something great and so if that's ingrained in your culture then naturally these people come along and mock you by saying all samurai had were clean shaven and right today if you went to the middle east a clean shaven man is considered to be a woman and the ultimate punishment in the Ottoman Empire was the shaving of the beard. So it's understandable why they would put that into their narrative specifically to denigrate that culture. You find the same thing with gay marines in the Marine Corps that the the gayest marine is one that's married and you have all these different things the way that they push that stuff into the culture to specifically subvert the martial valor. It's the same tactic they represent everywhere and it's usually done through the presentation of an invented character and brainwashed patsies they'll have those people dress up in disguise and go out and pretend to be something specifically so they can mock him the court jester idea right you take the court jester dress him up put him in a marine corps uniform then you can denigrate the marine corps or if you want to take the old timey concept you take the court jester in england dress him up in the attire of the french king and then you can mock the French and the French king. That's the idea, anyway. And then the the anger and hatred is diverted and set towards the mark, the person being set up as the jester. And that allows the coward who put the person up to it in the first place to escape, often even under that person's own identity. So, some here I've got some a list of examples of the other kinds of hidden motives and the different ways that the agents and minions of this bloodline confidence game control structure of religious supremacy and blood right uh, can be found in practical operations today. There's a business filings with an attorney named Jerome Bowman that's B-O-H-M-A-N, who, when you look at the e- each individual filing, it might not seem important, but when you look at them all together, you get the picture. The first one is the Brotherhood International Foundation, formed out of Dayton, Ohio, which allegedly is there to serve displaced Africans uh, with through scholarships and aid. Now, the primary thing to, to note about this is that I my uh, previous video I did, or just did, was about the child trafficking operation that's um, run through Dayton and other parts of Ohio. But also that scholarships were specifically listed as a way that Jeffrey Epstein used to silence some of his victims by offering them uh, scholarships, a good life, things like that, as long as they keep their mouth shut. And if they said anything, then their lives would be destroyed. So it's a control mechanism, specifically in relation to enslavement of children among other things. Also, obviously, reaping their children, taking their children from them because their life is essentially constructed under these the control structure of these people. Next, we have K-Air, also out of Dayton, which apparently maintains landing grounds and fields. Now, besides, obviously, under the cover of delivering U.S. mail, at least that's what's listed in the document, is that they'll they're doing it to deliver U.S. mail, among other things, deliver air freight, things like that. But they also maintain landing grounds and fields under K-Air. That's exactly what you would need if you were going to move people. You wouldn't 
move them through regular airports, you would move them through private airports and fields, which is essentially speaking what they do. Not to mention, they kind of control the fake government. Anyway, next you have uh, individual Richard David Crabtree of the Crabtree family estates on the Lancaster sales filing for Logan, Ohio, with Jerome Bowman as the attorney on that. And Logan, Ohio, as in my previous video, was related to the child trafficking operations through Dayton. The Coles. Next, you have J.A. Logan Appliances. Well, the purpose for it is listed as appliances, but in the fine print, as they say, buried in the details, is the actual purpose, which is to encumber personal property. With, I expect, a heavy focus on land. Next, you have the Logan Assurance Company. Now, mind you, these are called Logan, and there is a city of Logan, Ohio. But these business filings are out of Dayton. Only the Lancaster Sales, which ironically is a city uh, close to Logan, but not Logan, is actually in Logan. Now, the Logan Assurance Company states that its purpose is plumbing, heating, and electrical, but also to control, acquire, and maintain real estate. So, as you can see, there's an overall purpose, which is repeated everywhere, about land theft and, and uh, trafficking of people, controlling them, all this other stuff, and the tectonic warfare of moving people from their, their homes in different places so that they can destroy it, and then we can send people over there to destroy their homes while our homes are being destroyed. The usual thing there. Next, you have Interfaith Realty. And those business filings, of which there are more, all essentially speaking together relate to this Jerome Bowman being a mechanism for uh, money laundering, human people laundering, and land theft, among other things, of course. Now, as far as money laundering goes, the Hocking County Commission, uh, which is uh, the seat of which is in Logan, Ohio, paid to Triad Government Systems Incorporated $18,090 for a software subscription. That's unlikely. Some people might try to argue that that's not money laundering, that there are in fact software subscriptions that cost that much, if not more, and that those people are not overpricing their software subscription uh, more than, of course, its true value. But when you research the Triad Government Systems Incorporated, you find out it's an unmarked building in... Um, essentially middle of nowhere town, rundown area, and it looks like they're up to no good if that even is their true address, principal office address. Now the next example from the Hocking County Commission is road resurfacing from Walnut Dowler and Narrows Road in the amount of $953,666.69. There is no re road resurfacing on the planet for one road that would cost a million dollars. Also, they paid $669,946.20 for road resurfacing from Greedale to Limeback to Sanner Road. And mind you, this is not a large city. In many cases, it could be considered just a town. Arnold, Gore, and Greendale roads cost $641,455 for road resurfacing. That's impossible. Nobody would get away with charging that much. That's clearly money laundering. Now, the Supreme Court of Ohio appointed judges paid $7,008 from and 67 cents from the county commission. That's suspicious alone, but the implications of that are even more disturbing. Then they paid Randy Moore $6,058.79 for fuel. And a person they paid that much for fuel. Could be jet fuel, could be plane fuel, but either way they just specified fuel. Obviously, they audit themselves. And so anybody who comes along and starts asking questions for these anomalies, it's extremely likely that they are misreporting things because nobody is going to hold them accountable. At least they think that anyway. Now, office supplies they paid for from Office Mart. 
oh, I guess I didn't have the, uh, didn't have the price written down there, but it was a lot. Anyway, the uh, Board of Developmental Disabilities General Fund, they paid in $750,000, which that's not suspicious, of course, because none of these are, apparently. I guarantee there are many people out there who clearly are liars, who you would say these things to, and they would dismiss it with a comment. But this stuff is, is very obviously money laundering, if not more. The Henshin and Associates were paid $5,000 for, quote, support. The Office of City, the office City Express was paid $2,500, but the money isn't the biggest deal. It's for what is per listed purpose is for exp an expansion project of the detective room. Yeah, that's pretty weird. Next, the County Commissioners Association of Ohio was paid membership dues in the amount of $7,813. Emergency Service Equipment Company was paid $29,760 for bulletproof vests. Now, I've bought bulletproof vests, and there's virtually none that would cost that much money for the small number of people that they actually have on their so-called law enforcement force. Now, the Fairfield County Sheriff's Department, was, which, by the way, Fairfield County is not Hawking County, they were paid $6,164 for housing inmates. That's not just that alone. They paid... $120,696.62 to the Corrections Commission of Southeast Ohio, headquartered in Fairfield County. Not Hawking County. This is the Hawking County Commission, unless you forgot. <laughs> Courtview Justice Solutions was paid $17,348 for hosting yearly fees. Now, the uh, another weird thing about this is the Indiana and Ohio Railroad Company was paid $1,350 for 2024 dues to storm sewer pipeline. Now, the strange reason and the relatively small amount of money that was paid, considering the other large payouts they made, the weirdest thing about this is that the Indiana and Ohio Railroad Company does not exist and did not exist when this uh, listing was written. In fact, it was merged out of existence in the 90s. And this stuff is from, like, this year and last year. So, they paid money to a company that doesn't exist. That's not suspicious. Now, uh, the Appraisal Research Corp was paid $2,994.75 for a new construction contract in 2023. Now, the Appraisal Research Corps, or, yeah, Corporation, allegedly gave consent to the Tax Equity Corporation to use the name Appraisal Research Corporation of Indiana Incorporated. Now, if that's not misleading enough, the Ohio-based Tax Equity Corporation was formed under the Ohio General Corporation Law in 1989, and stipulates it will provide services to real estate taxpayers, lease, sell, or purchase real estate. Sounds pretty corrupt, doesn't it? The Indiana Ohio Railroad Company was formed in 1989, and as I stipulated before, was merged out of existence in the 90s. Now, a lot of these old documents reference a free act and deed as being the purpose for articles of incorporation or association. And also that the Ohio General Corporation Law stipulates that names must not be changed to mislead the public. Obviously, they change names specifically to mislead the public, and also they don't recognize anymore that articles of association and incorporation actually form an act and deed, as in you can't just form the act and deed of articles, they have to be done in their format. Now, also when it comes to changing names to mislead the public, clearly in violation of the uh, no, no longer enforced Ohio uh, general corporation law, there was a filing for Slobodker Benevolent Association around the early 1900s, 
which was then changed to Forest City Benevolent Association and then changed to the Forest City Hebrew Benevolent Association. Obviously very different from the word Slobodker. Now when you look up Slobodker, Google will naturally change the name to Slobodka, obviously attempting to hide whatever that word signifies. If you try to put that in, you simply cannot search the word Slobodker. There's no results. And in fact, not even the corporation, once called the Slobodker Benevolent Association, now the Forest City Hebrew Benevolent Association, it doesn't come up. The next one is something called Brighton Unterstützung Werken, changed to the Brighton Benevolent Association Number 2 of Cincinnati, Ohio. And of course, they've got different reasons for it. Either way, it's designed to hide through name changing. Next, we have the Christian Benevolent Association of Greater Cincinnati Incorporated, whose purpose is to acquire real estate and specifically the perpetuation of residential care and also to encumber real estate. You find that in many cases with most of these business filings with corrupt names and linked to corrupt operations that mostly they care about taking the land. As they would say, their land, their promised, the land promised to them. Now, another angle to this is the uh, concept of the false stag and peacocking, or stolen valor. These concepts are things we've been mistaught, so let's go and look at them a little bit. Usually they repeat the same phrase, never meet your heroes, and this is because they propagate false stories of heroism. That is actually what stolen valor is. We're taught that it only relates to somebody going around and claiming service in the military, even though they haven't been in the military. Then if someone looks up the U.S. Code definition, they find it's a very narrow thing that has to do with awards and things like that. But the true idea of stolen valor is somebody who's bearing false witness, saying they saw something or did something that never happened in reality. And when you do this a lot, it manages to bury the truth and not only it exorbitantly, when somebody exaggerates something that's not only impossible but never happened, it diminishes the true things that happened that might seem a little bit different. But the difference is that somebody can write any sort of extravagant tale, but when you find out that someone did something in reality that's interesting, when you can compare them and figure out one is false and one's not, the one that's not false becomes more important. However, when there's a disproportionate relation and also the belief that something that's false is true, then you have a problem. It's, it incentivizes lying, of course, and de-incentivizes true acts of heroism in reality following in the footsteps of people who really did things that were heroic, and also reinforces the idea that there's only heroes in fiction that there's no actual heroes in reality because the uh, structure, the incentivization of lying and fabricating stories and things like that and pretending to be something you're not, not only does it bury the true acts, but also they attempt to remove those reference to those true acts altogether because the idea is about targeting the capabilities of others. Now this hijacks the natural instinct to follow stories and to mislead that person to follow false stories. It's part of the psychological campaigns to diminish the security of a free state of human beings, of other people. Not only that, but also to make them more malleable and control them more and to make them jaded, to impose things like um, uh, fatalism. But you also find this psychological campaign in the... Uh, enforced narrative of modern evolution and the myth of dinosaurs. All of these are designed to specifically denigrate humans and humanity and the martial valor, the spirit of courage that is inherent in the natural human to make sure that when people grow up, they believe that stuff doesn't exist. And so they're much more likely to go out and do nasty things for the person who's imposing that perspective. Now this gets into the idea of law, custom, and practice. The targeting, the culture of rival enemies. These 
bloodline perspectives recognize all other families as enemies and so what they want to actually do is target those customs those traditions the culture of those rival families to break it apart to estrange the members to remove the identity and to ensure that the people involved in that family no longer have anything in common so the first thing of course is to denigrate the clothing make fun of people uh, target them for cultural appropriation if they wear so-called in american indian regalia ceremonial clothing that they're there to quote unquote protect and also the activities to remove uh, festivities and dancing to remove activities to denigrate them to ensure that marines uh, Com uh, the camaraderie of Marines, the quote-unquote fraternization, making fraternization a crime in the Marine Corps, considering the word fraternization has to do with fraternity. But it's not a crime to fraternize in the frat houses of universities. It's only a fr crime to fraternize in the Marine Corps. And also that whenever Marines get together, that they're, you ensure that there's a uh, perspective of homosexuality imposed on it and then that means that marines that get together for purposes of valor begin to separate and splinter away because they don't want to be involved in that stuff because they joined the marine corps for the martial valor not to play games like gay chicken and other nonsense but that's the point it's specifically targeting the clothing activities and culture of the rival family and those that practice it in the Marine Corps are in fact guilty of treason and with all the other branches too so it mostly begins with the, the natural habit towards initial thought associations so now we get into the actual practical mind control operations to get people to do things without them realizing it to specifically mold them into gullible individuals and marks and what I find I always found interesting were the people that would jeer and taunt and would relish getting it over on somebody who is clearly gullible right there's no challenge in it but they relish the fact that they took someone uh, for a, a fool who was clearly a fool right it's like you know it's like uh, uh, you open a, you make a big deal out of opening a can or a jar. And most people look at that and say, well, that was easy. You know, that's not a challenge, right? Most people do not think that it's uh, worthy of celebration to do something, think something's not a challenge. And so you have these people who study a long time how to con people, how to um, mislead them. But they only ever practice this on people who are gullible, people who are easy. They don't ever practice it on somebody who's difficult. And that is where you find masters versus posers. There's a lot of posers today who think they're master confidence men, and most of those people are taken for marks um, by individuals who do not laugh and jeer when they actually get one over on someone, and who do not think that it's something to be worthy of pride when you con a gullible person it's who's been trained so they train people to be gullible through these a uh, mental thought association habits this is well known in many confidence men circles about how to uh, get people to do things through suggestion through repetition and getting their thoughts to associate feelings and ideas with certain situations or activities The first and most obvious example of this is that when somebody says the word apple, we all think of an apple that's red. Rather than a green apple, of which there are green apples, or a yellow one, a golden apple as it were, or any other color, we always associate the apple with the color red. That's one example of the initial thought programming that many of us are subjected to. Now the Rorschach inkblot test is used by so-called psychologists and therapists to measure the appropriate effects of thought association control. And if that person has not been perfectly calibrated to, us, to the proper entrained 
initial thought association based off of these so-called ink block tests, right? They hold up a card and say, what image do you see with this? If you don't respond with the right answer, then they diagnose you with a mental uh, deficiency, a mental illness, which then requires you, of course, to be properly calibrated, properly trained like you would any machine to respond correctly to that uh, indicator. Now, stopping at a stop sign or a stop light is further embedded through the ingrained and trained fear of having a wreck or being pulled over. Most people would stop actually at stop lights and stop signs only when they fear being pulled over. And so that is activity under coercion, under duress. But it's so commonplace and normal today that most people don't realize that in fact they're doing this uh, against their will, essentially. Vaccines, of course, are opposed to the fear of being sick or uncomfortable, uncomfortability. When that doesn't work, they attempt to use the threat of force. You know, get a vaccine or else, basically. We're going to do all this nasty stuff to you. But usually it's done under the fear of being sick, which is actually the fear of being uncomfortable. People who are afraid of being sick are afraid of the uncomfortableness that comes with that state of being so-called sick. Now, the stopping for the school bus is specifically and only enforced through the fear of going to jail. People do not stop for school buses because they're afraid of hitting children, by and large. They're only afraid of the nasty consequences that are done to people who don't stop for school buses and the fact that anybody who doesn't stop for school bus, well, and also the fictional stories that they constantly uh, replicate or uh, propagate about children that have been hit by some monster who just didn't stop for the school bus, right? If they were actually... Uh, doing things for the sake of the safety of children, well, then they wouldn't stop school buses in the middle of the road. They do that specifically to control traffic and to control people's behavior and to show that they control the children, that the children are their property. Otherwise, they would put them in a parking lot somewhere, drop them off in a safe space. Now, the next one is the fear of law enforcement is enforced through primarily two ways, the fear of chains or so-called handcuffs or going to jail. A lot of our habits are controlled and based on fear, ingrained, trained fear from an early age. Now, this is behavioral modification under threat from when you're in a child and it starts in the school system. And it's specifically designed for enslavement to ensure that you are gullible and easy to control based off of threat. There are not many people today who are not trained cowards who cannot be manipulated by threat. And that means that anyone that catches on to that can essentially do whatever they want simply by threatening. Most people. Often that times that can backfire. If you try to threaten somebody who can't be threatened, they will simply take the threat as a provocation and then you'll be in a legitimate contest. So in some cases, you should probably be able to actually back up the threat if you ever leverage it, just in case you might run into somebody who's not easily manipulated by threat alone. Now, the threat is usually under pain of death. It's uh, coercion under duress and trained from an early childhood, you know, like the idea of withholding bathroom privileges to make a child uncomfortable, you know, uh, or going to the principal's office but by and large, most of us today are controlled under the threat of the bullet being shot by so-called uniformed law enforcement. But this is also uh, reinforced through TV series uh, where they replicate the same narratives. But specifically about characters that you're supposed to emulate, the main character, right, this action hero, across the board, in different TV shows and movies, you will find those characters repeating the same phrase. I don't like guns. They want people to not have guns because they want people to relate themselves to those characters. To the character that's lauded, to the one that's set up on the pedestal, to the one you want to emulate. And that person doesn't like guns, so neither should you. You should go around fighting people with your fists and whatnot. Leave the guns to the authorities. That, of course, is all about dissuading against the security of the free state or undermining the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution and is treason, at least in the United States. 
according to the Constitution, anyway. This is essentially the same idea as the religious devotion to the idea, the concept of killing as being a bad thing. Now, obviously, they go around killing people with no problem, and they always have justifications for it. But in every other context, they always repeat the same thing, killing is bad. Right? It's not murder, it's killing. And then they will label you a quote-unquote killer as though that's something you don't want to be. The real reason, of course, why that is is because they want to kill everyone else, but they don't want to in turn be killed, and so they constantly repeat the same narrative. And they get people over time to, through initial thought association, to associate kill with bad, so you avoid killing it's preferable to, preferable to maim, to do everything else but kill, especially when the person's really bad. In movies and TV shows often, as everybody says about the tropes with so-called superheroes, they always have the most trouble when it comes to the villain in the story. They always have the most trouble bringing the villain to justice, and especially when you have characters who kill other people in the stories, they always have this moral dilemma across the board in all the narratives when they come to killing the villain. It's very rare that you have a TV show or a movie where the main character comes up to the villain and just shoots him, right? Very rare. Most of the time, somebody might say that that's for suspense, but I would say it's more than likely for thought programming to get people to make themselves easier to control, manipulate, and less defensible undermining the security of the free state. So naturally, this is a situation in which you would want to deprogram people in a way that they then have control over their own thoughts, their own mind, because right now most people do not even control their own thoughts. It's controlled by other people, other mechanisms and programs to train them to do it. They don't actually control their initial thought association. Like I said before, when someone says the word apple, you think red. That means you don't have control over your own thought patterns. You don't think gold or, or green or whatnot. Some people might. Some people might have control. But by and large, most of us are trained in some way to think of apple as red and to think of killing as bad. Killing anyone, right? No matter what they did, no matter what they do, so that those people can then be protected and then allowed to continue doing what they do, because obviously killing's the ultimate sentence. So well even the word sentence, the ultimate measure of justice. It's the ultimate way to arrest somebody's activities. So uh, one idea that you can deprogram is through a jarring misassociation, which with many people is often worse than torture. They're minds are so molded that they can't handle having things shown to them that simply do not conform to their ingrained, their trained associations. You can do this through cards that have the wrong colors and mixed images, such as, say, a bl bride wearing black, a, uh, you know, a, 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 a businessman who's dressed or you could have like a you know all, all kinds of there's all kinds of ways you can misassociate things on purpose you can uh add labels to them that are inappropriate to the picture or the the color and all of these things would work to jar people's uh ingrained initial thought associations another thing you could do is you can take multicolored rubber bands put them on your wrist and every time you have a thought association initially that you know is not your own, you snap a color associated to that particular thought category. And in that case, it's the mechanism of your mind processing the different colors and their associations that will eventually, over time, allow you to regain control over your initial thought patterns. Now, emotional seeding is a big thing. It's a big deal. In order to reverse a lot of what's been done, a person has to understand emotional seeding and the most example the most the most apparent example of this is with the gym where pain actually equates to a healthier body or in a healthier state and the more you go to the gym the more you develop the sense that uh, in order to achieve what you want you actually have to go through difficulty rather than 
doing things to remove difficulty. You embrace the difficulty as a way to become better, to obtain a better life, rather than trying to run away from things that are painful. Now, there are some other things that, of course, we've been, we've been misled on, that in order for our perspectives, our conceptualization ability to expand, we have to re not only regain control over our initial thought patterns, but also understand that many of the concepts that we've been, that we believe are our own are not. The first of those is the fact that dog barking is in fact a language, and it's similar to Morse code. You can in fact communicate with dogs if you figure out the association of duration, pitch, and uh, repetition in relative to objects and other things like that. You can actually learn to communicate with them. Animals are not impossible to communicate with as we have been told and trained. Dogs, and of course when you realize that, then the whole idea of actually training becomes almost an abhorrent thing. You don't want to train animals, you don't want to train people. It's a mechanism for turning them to, into gullible slaves. It's not good for nature and it's not good for the individual. You would do that to somebody you hate, basically. And they do. They hate us. So when you control your initial thought patterns, you can expand your conceptualization of understanding, but you can also self-discover, right? You can become a master of yourself. You can discover things about yourself that you wouldn't ever know because you're thought programmed to have initial thought based off objects and things like that that you've has been trained from an early age. Of course, you can grasp diverse knowledge and with knowledge and the ability to conceptualize beyond initial thought patterns that are, are trained, uh, a person can become far more capable and a threat to the ones who did it in the first place. Now, coming back to this control structure of the uh, bloodline perspective and uh, subterfuge, con artistry, identity theft, thieving of land and finance and all of these other things they do, we'll first look at the National Association of Counties, so-called, and the fact that they have continuing edu education requirements or mandatory classes in order to hold office. So not only do you think that you elect people to these offices in local communities, but those people in order to hold office have mandatory classes. Anybody who can stipulate that someone like that obviously controls that so-called office. And the National Association of Counties so apparently supports universal health care. Now there's an interesting court case allegedly between the IC Power Asia Development LTD listed at 45 Rothschild Boulevard, Tel Aviv, Israel. Now, if that name's not weird enough, they uh, apparently uh, tried to sue in the international court in uh, Europe, the Republic of Guatemala, for apparently ignoring their legitimate tax break uh, arguments and charging them exorbitant amounts of uh, money on the tax burden of corporations that they'd purchased apparently without the knowledge that there were these tax burdens on these things. So basically saying the Republic of Guatemala is extorting them. The interesting thing about that obviously is that the Republic of Guatemala is a subsidiary of the United Nations. So uh, next we have uh, NACO or the uh, National Association um, of, oh yeah, that, that's the National Association of Counties, of course. Now, they support collective action for appropriate behavioral change, public health considerations in land use planning and community design. I think we all know what that actually means. Coded wording, of course. Now, they want to work with the federal, state, and county insurers and providers for single claims forms and electronic billing. That's for fraud, of course. And this uh, document was from 2006. They also posed a right way to run a meeting, and naturally their so-called chair of the committee is sitting on a throne above everyone else. Now the Atlantic community 
is a, an interesting entity, first of all, that elevates itself above all, and they're behind the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and also the Atlantic Council of the United States, which is a DOD listed, the Atlantic Council of the United States is listed as a DOD contractor, over 25,000, and they operate something called a Space Development Agency, at least it's apparently under the DOD, and they say uh, SDA model is for the repurposing of organizations. And that they want to find the right charismatic leader to provide top cover beyond length of time of political appointees. And they want to disrupt entrenched mindsets. Isn't that interesting? Now the next thing we're going to look at is this operation to essentially what I believe to cover up uh, not only mass murder, uh, possible uh, disturbing experiments, mass graves, but also child trafficking operations. And the universities are doing this under cover of so-called government. And it's specifically on their lists, the removal of non-human remains. This is done, uh, this is found anyway in documents titled uh, Completion of Inventory, they leveraged the funerary label, which basically just means it was buried in the ground, and uh, of uncovered artifacts and alleged human remains. Now, obviously, another purpose for this could be to hide technologies or other things that relate to information and knowledge they don't want us to have. In every context, there are always universities involved. There's always a university contact, and these individuals are specifically trying to hide stuff from the regular people that I guarantee they would get hanged for if it was ever discovered by the communities that they were removing these artifacts, human remains, or whatever it was from. Some examples, one example is from the Federal Register, Volume 88, number 238, uh, and also most of these are popping up in 2023 and 2024. The Aleutian Islands had uh, unknown people removed from unknown locations and allegedly delivered to the University of Alaska Mu Museum of North Fairbanks, Arkansas, under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, funeral, funerary designation. And that's, of course, uh, one of their many wet methods that they uh, lie and protect things that they absolutely do not want other people finding out about. Um, they determine cultural affiliation, and you also had... Uh, human remains and associated funerary objects allegedly uh, taken from Douglas County, Nevada. And the notice of inventory completion at the Museum of Natural History in New York from March 20th, 2024, the <clears throat> it lists this very strange footnote, museum applied potentially hazardous pesticides to items in collection uh, they stipulate to follow the advice of industrial hygienists or medical personnel with specialized training in occupational health or with potentially hazardous substances. And that's apparently something applied to human remains uh, taken from Walter Hilberg, who apparently purchased them, which I expect is a euphemism for stole, from the Sterling Farm in 1898 from Oved, uh, Oneida Valley. New York. Now, also, we come into other documents, which all read like textbooks, from the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. Uh, they state they're a link between state and Department of Defense, uh, call themselves PM, and the objective of 1.2 is for security partners to act with increasing effectiveness to counter armed non-state actors whose activities threaten the United States or its partners. So basically the internationalist global control of these um, blood relative, uh, you know, supremacy of their religious control structure people who uh, obviously all of us would be considered um, armed non-state actors, but you have to wonder how many other individual, what other thing, that's a very vague term obviously. Next is the third goal is to foster sustainable and resilient security sectors that respect human rights. And of course, that's the International Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations to usurp every law 
custom and practice of everyone else basically on behalf of those bloodline controllers and they're naturally the rule of law and de democratic values rule of their law they act want to act in a matter consistent with universal human rights so like i said the de universal declaration of human rights of the united nations and they want to <clears throat> investigate potential end use violations and meet end user requirements and i'm sure we're all familiar with those in the particular uh, extorted uh, requirements of user agreement and user agreements that Facebook and things like that have where basically you can't use the platform unless you agree to sell your soul and your property and your family and everything else you know that type of stuff and the interesting thing is that they want to reintegrate the United States into international leadership and they want to say this they say that this is to counter Chinese aggression and of course, naturally, the Chinese is a subsidiary of the United Nations. But I find it interesting that they want to use that as a cover for the re so-called reintegration into international leadership positions of the United States. Also, it references the Department of Military Affairs structure, Vang commands and joint staff, star base with a person called S. Corrigan, uh, who has teaching staff under them. I mean, this stuff doesn't seem to add up. These words don't compute. Then you have the state AASF and the Virginia Defense Force, the Virginia Air Guard, MTC, and then there's a structure called Challenge with Commandant K. Negrin and Deputy R. Guzman. So it's possible that, and likely that these so-called command structures are part of their future plans for occupational domination under overt international so-called law. Next, we have the International Council Chiefs of Police, who apparently were formed in 1893 and a very interesting symbol of a C, A, and cross. And uh, they want criminal justice reform with targeted recruitment efforts as historically black colleges and universities. So isn't that interesting? And they want pr to promote alternative approaches to assisting individuals in behavioral or mental health crises. That sounds familiar and sustainable improvements to public health services and housing loan forgiveness incentives. So I've done many videos about this talking about how the fact that they expect to raise an army of gangsters, put uniforms on them, and control them through the housing market, financial de-incentivization and incentivization, and specifically through draconian requirements for rental permits and for owning property. And that's where you get their what they call housing loan forgiveness incentives. They want a mandatory five-day waiting period for handgun purchasing, removal of firearm under extreme risk protection order or red flag, the prohibit or prohibit prohibition of preemption or mandates for concealed carry reciprocity, meaning you can carry concealed guns across state lines and not get in trouble for that. They want to prohibit the mail order of protective vests and uh, reference something called Project Safe Neighborhoods and Project Exile and their effectiveness. A ban on production and sale of semiotic assault weapons. National Registry of a Misdemeanor that involved violent or threatening acts, which means of course somebody else could be doing violent or threatening acts, but then you would be charged with the misdemeanor and recorded on a registry. That's how they played these word games. And then they also want to strike from the definition of fled from justice in the u.s code the addition of from any state yeah, I, gotta, I gotta move this so it would basically be if you fled from justice you're a fugitive period that includes a different country so-called international law it doesn't matter